Following the conformity and growing internal tensions of the 1950s, the 1960s were a time of social unrest and cultural revolutions. The Vietnam War instigated the infamous anti-war protests, which gave way to the hippie and psychedelic movement. Other movements, such as feminism and sexuality, also became prevalent during this time period. These social evolutions can be described as the counterculture of the 1960s. The Hippie Revolution was originally a youth movement that arose in the United States during the mid-1960s. The origin of the term hippie is from the word hipster and was initially used to describe beatniks who had moved into New York City's Greenwich Village and San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district. The early hippie ideology included the countercultural values of the beat generation. Hippies were sometimes called flower children. They were suspicious of the government, rejected consumerist values and mainstream society, and generally opposed war. Instead, they created their own social groups and communities, listened to psychedelic rock, embraced the sexual revolution, and explored recreational drugs such as marijuana and LSD to provide a release from society. The hippie movement exploded during the summer of 1967, which was known as the Summer of Love, at the Height Ashbury District in San Francisco, California. Scott McKenzie's rendition of the song, San Francisco, Be Sure to Wear Flowers in Your Hair, brought as many as 100,000 young people to celebrate San Francisco's Summer of Love, making it the largest hippie gathering at the time. This unprecedented gathering of people is considered to be a social experiment which later led to the acceptance of alternative lifestyles such as gender equality, communal living, and free love. This social phenomenon propelled the hippie movement into the media. Hype Ashbury, or Hashbury, became the epicenter of the hippie revolution. By June 1966, over 15,000 hippies moved into the district. They did not have any jobs or money, so they slept on sidewalks, and panhandled for food or sold marijuana or acid tablets. The streets were populated with freaks, dropouts, and nonconformists. Hashbury was a unique community with different programs tailored to the hippie lifestyle, such as the psychedelic shop for meditation or the blushing peony for clothes. By 1967, over 100,000 people poured into the San Francisco area and established it as the counterculture center. Hippies were known for their eccentric lifestyles. <laughs> they held no interest in political issues and thought America had become too conformist and materialistic. So instead of trying to fix the system, they rejected it. They preached the values of peace, love, and happiness to the masses and made bliss their number one goal. Warren Wallace asked them what they thought the hippie movement was trying to accomplish. Uh, what, what we're thinking about is a peaceful planet. We're not thinking about anything else. We're not thinking about any kind of power. We're not thinking about any of those kind of struggles. We're not thinking about revolution or war or any of that. That's not what we want. Nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. We would all like to be able to live an uncluttered life, a simple life, a good life, you know, and like think about moving the whole human race ahead a step or a few steps. <clears throat> And, or half uh, a step. Yeah, or a half a step, or anything. So at least no nice. more positive. At least not going around in circles like it is now. Hippies thought that they could save America through flower power and by being peaceful. Their mantra was basically, do your own thing. And they were adamant about not enforcing anything upon anyone. They did not support any specific drugs and did not have any clear objectives, but only desired to seek personal freedom through sex, drugs, and music. Hippies had a style all their own that marked the 60s. Tie-dye, bell-bottom jeans, peace signs, and flowers were their trademarks, as well as long hair and the infamous John Lennon glasses. Turn on, tune in, drop on. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Drugs more than anything else visibly defined the counterculture of the 1960s. People everywhere began to experiment with recreational drugs, 
such as marijuana and LSD. Drugs had always been prevalent in America before, but it wasn't until the 60s that drugs started to trickle into the middle class society. People turned to drugs to escape reality. It let them alter their consciences and have an out-of-body experience. LSD was the favorite of hippies and drug users everywhere, especially after Timothy Leary, a Harvard University psychology professor, promoted it and its ability to expand the human conscience. He advised millions of Americans to turn on, tune in, and drop out, and this phrase was a slogan of all hippies and avid drug users of this time. Dr. Leary, LSD has made you either a prophet or a pariah. What, uh, what fashion would you use, or how would you summarize your own experiences with the drug? What, what has it done to you, to your mind? First of all, we have to ask the question, what is LSD? LSD is a chemical, but it's not a drug. Most Americans are familiar with two drugs which change consciousness. Drugs which put us into a stupor, uh, drugs which wake us up. Almost every American uses one of these two. We use uh, opiates or tranquilizers or alcohol to put us into a nice cozy stupor. Or we use drugs like pep pills or even coffee to wake us up. But there are many other levels of consciousness, many other levels of awareness which can be triggered off by chemicals. When you take LSD and uh, your conscience expanded, uh, uh, the number of possibilities and the number of perspectives dramatically multiplies. Drugs and music were inseparable ingredients of the drug-oriented counterculture. Some songs were specifically written to complement drug use to induce a higher sense of euphoria. The Beatles' song, A Day in the Life, used special effects to enhance the listener's natural high. One aspect of 1960s counterculture was a change in the American attitude towards sexual expression. Free love was advocated throughout the time. Premarital sex, infidelity, and homosexuality became more pronounced and accepted. Traditional beliefs such as waiting until marriage and having only one partner were overshadowed by casual sex and multiple partners. Consumerism and the media also had overtly sexual themes in advertisements, music, magazines, books, and movies. The moral standards surrounding sex and contraceptives were loosened. Contraceptives became popular, especially birth control, but the number of sexually transmitted diseases also rose. America overall experienced a sexual liberation that still continues to be prevalent to this day. Make me some food! No, I am tired of making food for you! You can go cook for yourself! I'm an independent woman! The feminist, the so-called the second wave of feminist, is, feminism is sort of the largest example of this. Uh, a new women's movement arises. It, the women's movement had been pretty moribund after the achievement of the vote. Now a new women's movement arises, but its issue is no longer political rights, which have been gained, but personal rights, education, opportunity, economic equality, equa uh, opportunity or freedom in personal life, access to birth control, abortion, control over your own person, the right to live a lifestyle that you choose. The feminist movement pushes the issue of freedom into private life. It makes it plain that there are questions of rights, power, liberty, even in the most intimate areas of human activity. So it really helps to expand the idea of freedom way beyond the public sphere, the economic sphere, into this realm of private life that, um, where it hadn't really been extended very much before then. The 1960s marked a revival of the feminist movement and women's rights. One of the earliest and most well-known voices calling for equal rights for women was Betty Friedan. In 1963, she published her groundbreaking novel, Feminine Mystique which warned that millions of women were losing their personal identity by confining themselves to the roles of mothers and housewives. This encouraged women to break out of their social norms and become more independent. In 1966, Frieden helped to found the National Organization for Women, known as NOW. This organization used different tactics 
to fight for equal treatment of women. Feminists did achieve some of their goals through Congress, such as the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964. These two acts prohibited discrimination in employment and compensation, not only on race, but now in gender. This renewal of feminism in the 60s counterculture was necessary for women to attain real freedom and equality in the United States. By 1969, counterculture was coming to a close and ended with a bang with the Woodstock Festival. The hippie movement died down as its members grew older. However, hippie ideology such as peace and love still continue today, especially with the infamous peace sign. The drug scene is still alive and growing, and the sexual revolution that was so radical in the past is now commonplace in today's world. Women equality has come a long way since the 1960s thanks to the feminist revival. Even though the 1960s counterculture came to an end, it created a lasting impression on American society that can be seen today. Sugar. I smell like maple syrup. <laughs>